Good afternoon and welcome. I'd like to tell you about my new book, 400 Years in America. When I started this project, I intended to write about my 17th century immigrant ancestors. However, with over 220 individuals in that category, I quickly decided to limit the subjects of the book to my earliest immigrant ancestors up to and including my paternal line ancestor, Garrett Hendrickson Blauvelt, who emigrated in 1641. This meant I had to leave out many ancestors I wanted to write about, but it still left me with a total of 55, which was more than enough. And I know that these 55 earliest settlers of New Netherland, after 10 generations of descendants, are the ancestors of many millions of Americans living today. Now, this first slide you can see with the title of my book at the top is a watercolor drawing on paper entitled New Amsterdam on the Island of Manhattan. The date of the view is estimated to be between 1650 and 1653. And from what I know of Lower Manhattan in 1650, this view is from the Brooklyn side of the East River looking across. And to the left would be the, let me get my pointer out here. To the left over here is the Southern tip. And this is all part of the Southern tip. But beyond this, beyond the, on the other side of this window here, would be the Hudson River. Uh, this, this view was used as the front piece for volume one of the iconography of Manhattan Island, a work in six hefty volumes by I.N. Phelps Stokes. It was published between 1915 and 1928. And it was an important source for, for a lot of the information in my book. And you can get all six volumes on Amazon for just $748.37. All right, here you can see how I use part of the image on the book cover. Among the many stories in my book, I will focus on three individuals today, Jan de la Montagna, Cornelis van Tienhoven, and Garrett Hendrickson Blauvelt. As a general introduction to my book, we can zoom in here. I'm going to read just the first paragraph on the back cover. In the spring of 1624, the Eindracht a small ship from the Netherlands, entered New York Harbor. Among its passengers were the first permanent settlers of New Netherland. A few months later, another ship called the New Netherland arrived with more settlers destined for the Dutch colony. The year 2024 marks the 400 year anniversary of these events. Now, although there were, there were 30 families who came on those first two ships, we know of only four who survived and left descendants. The names of these families were Rapalia, Vigna, Montfort, and Dutriou. I am a descendant of the first three families. They were all ethnic Walloons. So who were the Walloons, you ask? <laughs> the Walloons were members of a French-speaking people inhabiting southern and southeastern Belgium and adjacent regions of France. In the years before and after 1600, many Walloons fled their homeland in the wake of war and religious intolerance. 
most emigrated to the Netherlands or to England. Let's look at this next slide. But before I tell you about our three persons adventures, I want to introduce you to one of these Walloons, Jesse DeForest, the man most responsible for the arrival of the first settlers, though he himself never set foot in the colony of the Netherlands. Sometime before 1615, Jesse DeForest and his family came to Leiden in the Netherlands from their homeland in Northern France. In Leiden, Jesse came to know the English pilgrims who were living there before they sailed on the Mayflower to New England in 1620. And it's notable that the, the original destination of the Mayflower was the Hudson Valley area, but they landed at Plymouth Rock instead. The pilgrims inspired Jesse to organize a similar plan of emigration. And through his ambition, perseverance, and leadership, Jesse DeForest prevailed upon the Dutch West India Company to sponsor a group of families he recruited to establish a settlement in the Dutch American colonies. To make a long story short, Jesse died in South America before he could join the first settlers to New Netherland. But he wasn't forgotten. In May of 1924, the cities of Aven in France and New York in the USA erected monuments to commemorate the 300th anniversary of the Walloon settlers' arrival in New York. President Calvin Coolidge and dignitaries from France, Belgium, and the Netherlands were present for the dedication in Battery Park in New York City. And this is what the monument looked like after it was first installed. And I, on the slide, I have included Jesse's distinctive signature here at the top, as well as the inscription on the monument. Presented to the city of New York by the Provincial Council of Ainu in memory of the Walloon settlers who came over to America in the New Netherlands under the inspiration of Jesse de Forest of Aven. And here, this is what the monument looks like today. It's behind a fence. And many people pass by, but few stop to notice the monument or the person and event it commemorates. Here's a closer look showing the uh, New York City buildings north of the park and the dates, you can kind of make them out here, 1624 to 1924. <clears throat> All right, I, I don't have a photo of the monument in France, but here is a, here's a translation of the inscribed text. To Jesse DeForest, his family, and his brave companions, who, looking for a new world <clears throat> where they could, in peace, affirm their beliefs and practice the reform religion, contributed greatly to the foundation of New York. Now, most of what we know about the, the journey of Jesse to South America comes from a journal of the trip. And though it is called Jesse's Journal, its author is reputedly Jan de la Montaigne, Jesse's friend and one of his companions on the trip. After Jesse died, Jan de la Montaigne, one of our three persons of interest today, returned to Leiden to resume his medical studies at the university. And there he married Jesse's daughter, Rachel. <clears throat> and several years later in 1636, finally emigrated with his family to New Netherland. Soon after he arrived, Jan de la Montaigne distinguished himself on several fronts. And these included his adept legal maneuvers 
to acquire the flats of Muscota after the sudden death of his brother-in-law, Hendrik de Porres. Mm -hmm. Rachel's brother, Hendrik, had emigrated with Jan and his family, and he was the earliest grantee and the first person who built on lands in what is now Harlem, New York City. After Montagna acquired the property, it was called Montagna's Flat. And here we have a, a map, a map of Harlem. And this map was drawn by James Riker in 1879 to illustrate his definitive history, Harlem, its origin and early annals. And it's important to realize that Montagna owned his property here before any of the other landowners indicated on the map. Over here is Montagna's flat, but we'll get a closer look at this. Yeah. Zoom in on this. Okay, here's Montagna's flat. It extended from about 109th Street to 124th Street and was bounded on the west by Morningside Heights. And that's the dark line here at the top. <clears throat> and it was about uh, 200 acres. And to the east was Van Coolen's Hook. And this property was formerly owned by Cornelis Van Tienhoven, our second person of interest. When Montagna received the official patent for the land in 1647, it included land between two creeks on the East River called Montagna's Point, just south of Van Coolen's Hook. And you can see it here on the map, Van Coolen's Hook, and here's Montagna's Point on the East River, or in this section, it's called Harlem River. All right, now let's get back to those first families of New Netherland. And just as a reminder, the names of the first families were, were Paglia, Vigna, Montfort, and Dutrieu. And they're shown here on the slide, put the names. The Vigna family included the patriarch, Guillet, his wife, Adriana Couvillier, and their three daughters, Maria, Christina, and Rachel. And they settled on property just north of today's Wall Street in this area, but we'll get a closer look at this in a minute. Where a brook emptied into the East River. Soon after they arrived, Adriana bore a son named Jan who was thought to be, though unproven, the first European male uh, born in New Netherland. He was the same Jan Vigne who sold a small lot on Broadway, just south of Maiden Lane, to our third person of interest, Garrett Hendrickson Blavo, in 1663. And now I wanna make a, a, a short detour. Notice here the the dotted lines showing the approximate boundaries of lower Manhattan today. And these dotted lines over here going to the right, that's an indication for the Brooklyn Bridge. Here's lower Manhattan today. The original shoreline is nowhere to be found. Now note, note here, Battery Park City over here on the left, all 92 acres of it between the Hudson River and West Street. It was built on landfill from the World Trade Center. And it is just the most recent uh, expansion of the city into the Hudson and East Rivers. Now compare this to Lower Manhattan in 1609 or at least an artist's rendering of, of Manhattan that Hendrick Hudson would have seen. 
the stream near the southern southeastern tip of the island over here, this would become a canal in New Amsterdam. And then when it was later filled in and called Broad Street. The small patch of green just to the north over here, that's where another stream emptied into the East River and where the Vinya family settled. And, a, and in this area between those two patches of green is the location of the future Wall Street. Now let's get back to that map. Um, let me point out some, um, some landmarks down here near the, the tip of the island. That's Fort Amsterdam and Broadway, Old Indian Trail. Um, and then the, the, the stream that became a canal that became Broad Street, that's over here. And of course, at, at the, in the 1600s, the mid 1600s, it's indicated, you can see that it's a canal. Now I'm gonna zoom in on this. One second. Here we go. Now let me draw your attention to the area of Wall Street. This is where the West India Company built fortifications. They built a wall along the northern boundary of the village. The corner of Wall Street and Broad Street over here, you can see part of the canal here, right on this corner, Wall Street and Broad, this is where Dutch merchants met to trade securities. It is no accident that the financial district we know today as Wall Street is located here. It was the Dutch who developed the first modern capitalist economy. For example, in 1602, the Dutch East India Company was founded in the Netherlands. It was the first ever multinational corporation financed by shares that established the first modern stock exchange. Now let's go to the area north of Wall Street and to Tamang de Pacha, the Maiden's Path. Um, this is, um, here is that other stream emptying into the East River where the Vinya family settled. Today, the street going east from Broadway is called Maiden Lane. And there's a plaque at uh, 15 Maiden Lane near Broadway um, that says that Maiden Lane, quote, was, the fir was first a path along the bank of a brook where Dutch maidens did their washing, unquote. It's the same brook or stream I just mentioned on the vineyard property. And the Dutch maidens were most likely the vineyard sisters, Maria, Christina, and Rachel. I have two different lines of ancestors that descend from Maria and Rachel. Thomas Jefferson, our first uh, Secretary of State stayed at a boarding house in the 1780s on Maiden Lane. And then he rented a house there in 1790 during the short period that New York was the capital of the United States. Okay, now before I introduce you to our second person of interest, Cornelis Van Tienhoven, I need to explain some family history. The patriarch of the Vinya family died sometime before 1635. His widow, Adriana Couvillier, married Jan Janssen Dahmen. Jan Janssen Dahmen owned considerable real estate to the west of the Vinya farm, all the way to the Hudson River. He was the first European owner of what would become the World Trade Center. 
as an advisor to the WIC West India Company director, Dahman exercised considerable influence in the administration of Governor Willem Kieft. And like Kieft, he was one of the investor co-owners of Captain Willem Blauvelt's ship, Lagarce, in the 1640s. Jan Janssen Dahman died in 1651. The extent of his considerable wealth was detailed in the inventory of his personal property that filled 10 folio pages in the records. Almost the entire Jan Janssen Dahman estate that included the old Vinny estate after Adriana Cuvier died in 1655, it all went to the three Vinya sisters, their brother and their spouses. Now let's get a closer look at this property. Okay, here's the land of Jan Janssen Dahmen. This is where the World Trade Center was built over here. And this is the shoreline. This is the Hudson River. And then we can see Broadway here. And this is Wall Street. And look here, land of Jan Janssen Dahmen again. This was formerly the Vinya Farm, but now uh, Dahmen owned all the property from the Hudson all the way to the East River. Now, uh, Maiden Lane is not indicated on this map, but it, it started about here on Broadway and then uh, ran in a easterly direction like this. And directly north of that was the property of Cornelis van Tienhoven. Now let's back up a little bit. <clears throat> Jan Dahmen's marriage to Adriana Cuvillier made him, naturally, the stepfather of the Vinya children. And evidence suggests that Jan Dahmen arranged the marriage of his youngest stepdaughter, Rachel Vigna, to secretary Cornelis Van Tienhoven in 1639. The two elder sisters were, were already married. Rachel was only 16 when she married the secretary. And now we get to Cornelis Van Tienhoven. Almost every document recorded in New Amsterdam bears Van Tienhoven's signature or mentions his name in some capacity. Here's one of those old documents, most of it anyway. Um, it's, it's, it's dated uh, 25 May, 1644. And his, uh, Van Tienhoven's signature is here at the bottom. And, and I'm gonna read a, a quote from Amsterdam and its people by J.H. Ennis. Cornelis van Tienhoven was identified, quote, more than any other individual with the history of New Netherland during at least a score of the earlier years of, of its existence. He early acquired an influence in the government of New Netherland which he preserved under such dissimilar administrations as those of directors Van Twiller, Kieft, and Stuyvesant. This influence he managed to maintain in spite of many rash and unfortunate schemes for which he was largely responsible, and in spite of the incessant attacks of his enemies who comprised a large part of the community. Here we can get a, a closer look at his signature here at the bottom. Cornelis van Tienhoven, secretary with a few flourishes, maybe to indicate his importance or self-importance. Despite, or perhaps because of his omnipresence in the records of New Netherland, it is hard to get a fair estimation of Cornelis van Tienhoven as the secretary of the New Netherland Council, he was largely responsible for the documents that, that are the basis of New Netherland's history. He, in effect, wrote the history. 
The council even passed an ordinance that stipulated no legal document was valid unless it was executed and signed by the secretary. Okay, now we will learn how Cornelis Van Tienhoven and Jan de la Montagna, two of my ninth great grandfathers, came together to influence the history of New Amsterdam and help to lay the foundation for the city that would become New York. Willem Kieft arrived in New Amsterdam on March 28, 1638, to assume his position as director of the West India Company of New Netherland. A few days later, on April 1st, he appointed Cornelis van Tienhoven to be his secretary and right-hand man. Van Tienhoven had been the company bookkeeper since he emigrated in 1633 and probably knew as much or more about the company's business in New Netherland as anyone else in the colony. Then a week later, on April 8th, Willem Kieft presided over his first meeting of the Council of New Netherlands. The council minutes were, quote, the executive, legislative, and judicial proceedings of the Director General and Council of New Netherlands, unquote. All three branches of government were vested in the Director General and the Council. Now, the first order of business on that first day, and I'll read from the council minutes, I'll try to make it sound official. The Honorable Director Kieft and Council, having considered the small number of councillors, have deemed it necessary to choose an experienced person to strengthen their number, and in consideration of the ability of Dr. Johannes La Montagna, the said Montagna has therefore been appointed by us a political counselor of New Netherland at 35 florins a month, commencing on the date hereof. <clears throat> it all sounds serious and official as it should. However, this first act of the Director General and Council is comical when you understand the circumstances. When Kieft appointed Dr. Montagna, there were no other councils on no other councillors on the council. The small the small number of councillors was zero. There were only four officials in the room: Director Kieft, Secretary Tienhoven, the Sheriff Ulrich Leupold, and the newly appointed Montagna. But he had to appoint Montagna first to so he could do the rest of the business for that day. <laughs> uh, to follow up on this first act of the council, from 1638 till the end of his tenure in 1647, Director Kieft appointed Dr. Johannes La Montagna as the sole member of his council, other than the non-voting secretary and sheriff. Cornelis Van Tienhoven did not have a vote on the council, but as the author and keeper of the records, he provided the relevant documents and offered his recommendations on matters before the council. Now, what if there was a disagreement between the only two voting members on the council? Well, the director's vote overruled Montagna's vote. It was a classic autocracy. The influence of Van Tienhoven and Montagna extended be beyond their responsibilities on the New Netherland Council. Both men were assigned to lead diplomatic missions and even military missions during the administration of Willem Kieft. When Petrus Stuyvesant became the director in 1647, both Van Tienhoven and Montagna maintained their positions on the council. And beyond that, Stavison appointed the two men to other positions, increasing their power and influence. For example, between 1652 and 55, Van Tienhoven also served as the attorney general and sheriff when the council functioned as a court. 
1656, Stavison appointed Johannes La Montagna to be the vice director and sheriff of Fort Orange. Both Van Tienhoven and Montagna exercised considerable influence in New Netherlands, but the two men wielded their power in different ways. Montagna was an honorable civic-minded magistrate compared to Cornelis Van Tienhoven, who often abused his power. I won't, get, I won't get into the details of Van Tienhoven's scandals as I do in the book. It would take more time than we have, and I want to use the remaining time to tell you about Garrett Hendrickson Blauvelt, whose emigration story previously had been obscured and misinterpreted for almost a century. Last month on uh, December 29th, I received an email from a Blauvelt descendant who wrote, quote, I am very interested in the information that some question aspects of our first ancestors arrival here and or marriages. Would it be possible to elaborate? Unquote. I wrote back to him. I am the Association of Blauvelt Descendants Historian and former genealogist. I did the research that questioned the identity of Garrett Henderson and his arrival here. There is no question about his marriage that identifies him as Garrett Hendrickson von Daventer. Unfortunately, the old story published in the 1957 Blauvelt genealogy and found in most all secondary sources suggests that a Garrett Hendrickson von Nykerk who arrived here in 1638 was the Blauvelt ancestor. Now the old story, it goes back to the second annual reunion of the Association of Blauvelt Descendants held in 1927. At the meeting, George H. Budkey, a respected Rockland County historian, gave a presentation in which he suggested that a Garrett Hendrickson von Nykerk in the province of Gelderland was the Blauvelt ancestor. He discounted the fact that the Blauvelt ancestor was from Daventer saying that the two towns were near each other, didn't matter, and based his theory on other circumstantial evidence. This theory of the Blauvelt ancestor was published in a 1931 article, and then published again in the 1957 Blauvelt genealogy, and it was repeated again and again in secondary sources and was generally accepted as an established fact. Now we can understand the significance of this slide that was published in the, uh, in the Blauvelt genealogy. This is a view of Daventer in the province of Overeysel. <clears throat> Daventer was the place of Garrett Hendrickson's baptism. Now notice here the bridge in the foreground. This bridge crosses over the Aesel River from the province of Gelderland where the photo was taken. The province of Overeysel gets its name from being the province that lies over the Aesel River. Uh, Overeysel. The Aesel River is a major south to north river of the Netherlands. When I was the genealogist for the Law Belt Association in the 1990s, I noticed several puzzling inconsistencies with conflicting information in the old story of Garrett Hendrickson's emigration to New Netherland. Without getting into all the details, the basic problem seemed to be a case of mistaken identity, though it was not clear to me at first. But as the genealogist for the association, I felt responsible to explain how, this two, how these two seemingly different people could be the same person as claimed in the old story. On a trip to the Netherlands in 1998, I spent some time researching at the National Maritime Museum in Amsterdam. And that's what's pictured here on the, on the slide. 
along with one of the old ships that's, that's anchored nearby. I was still trying to find the evidence that would resolve the discrepancies in the story of Garrett Hendrickson's origin. At the museum, I met another historian, Lawrence Vanderlaan. He was compiling a database of all the first settlers of New Amsterdam. And he said he understood my problem. He did not want to disappoint me, but the reason I could not find the connection between Garrett Hendrickson von Nykerk, who came to America in 1638, and Garrett Hendrickson von Deventer, the Blauvelt ancestor, was because there wasn't any. It was simply not the same person. Though all of my research was leading me to the same conclusion, I was disappointed. I wanted to believe the story as it appeared in the Blauvelt genealogy. But then I realized that all of my hard work was not in vain. Now I had the opportunity to set the record straight. In 2002, I wrote a detailed article on the origin of Garrett Hendricks and Blauvelt. But it wasn't until 2016 that I published a book, A Blauvelt Descendant, that presented the findings of my research. And I have a few copies here. Uh, and on the, this is a picture of the, of the uh, cover. And the image here is the, uh, you might notice, is the DeWint House, George Washington headquarters, it's a Masonic historic site in Japan, New York. In the same year, 2016, the Historical Society of Rockland County published my article, The Origin of Garrett Hendrickson Blauvelt in South of the Mountains. And here's a picture of the cover. And the image here on the cover is the Blauvelt Wappen in Dutch but we can translate it as a, the Blauvelt shield. And we can describe this shield as a gold bar with three gold spheres on a blue field. But let's take a look at a, at a color uh, version of this. Here it is, the gold bar, the three gold spheres on a blue field. And blue field is the probable derivation of the Blauvelt name. Blauvelt means blue field. My current book, 400 Years in America, presents the facts of Garrett Hendrickson's life, the one from Daventer, with a plausible explanation for the origin of the Blauvelt ancestor, but without any reference to the old story. In brief, I concluded that Garrett Hendrickson was a descendant of Peter of Enkhausen, the first known Blauvelt, and a member of the merchant ruling class in the Netherlands. Garrett came to America with his relative, Willem Albertson Blauvelt, captain of the ship Lagars, in 1641. In 1646, he married Marie Mole the eldest daughter of New Amsterdam's shipbuilder, Lambert Mole. Also in 1646, through his privileged relationship with Captain Blauvelt and director Willem Kieft, Garrett received the grant of a plantation over 50 acres, making him the next door neighbor of Petrus Stuyvesant when he became the director of the West India Company in 1647. Now, despite my books and articles, the email I received in December and the proliferation of secondary sources online repeating the old story of Garrett Hendrickson is evidence that few people know the new story. And that's the main reason I decided to include it in my presentation today, so that now you know. In addition to the uh, immigrant ancestors discussed today, 
400 years in America includes other notable first citizens of New Netherland. These include Cicero Alberto, the first Italian, Wolfert Gerritsen van Kohenhoven, the founder of the first European settlement on Long Island, Reverend Johannes Theodorus Polhemius, the first minister for the first three reformed congregations on Long Island. And Long Island at that time was essentially Brooklyn today. Asher Levy, who came with the first Jews to New Amsterdam in 1655 on the same ship that brought Reverend Polhemius from the former Dutch colony in Brazil. Cornelis Van Voorst, the first permanent European settler of New Jersey. Jonas Bronck, the first settler of the present borough of the Bronx. The first African slaves who built the fort and the names of the first freed slaves in the 1640s. Other firsts include the Wooden Horse Tavern and Philip Girardi, the first um, private tavern owner in the city, and the first stone church built within the fort where Garrett Hendrickson, Van Daventer, and Marie Mole were married. And all of this told within the context of the contemporaneous historical events. Now, most of these stories about the birth of a great world city are unknown to the general public. But I hope you have enjoyed this introduction to a few of them. Thank you.